Colton. Yes. Who's your favorite celebrity? I think I'm going to go with the uh, the Ryan Reynolds. Interesting choice. Interesting choice. If I'm honest, who do you think you know better, me or Ryan Reynolds? Uh, that's a hard thing because I've never met Ryan Reynolds in person, but I know a lot about him. But you have met me in person. Yeah. Roll it. Know the Word is a McGregor podcast that offers a relevant and refreshing focus on understanding and applying God's Word to your life. We'll discuss life-changing truths, a biblical faith that comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. I'm your co-host, Nathan Bottomley, and joining me today is our other co-host, Colton Silver. Join us as we open the Bible so we can know the Word. By the way, if you know Colton and I well enough, then you probably realize we just introduced one another as the other person. Let me rephrase that. We introduce ourselves as the other person, but this raises a very interesting point and hence our joke in the beginning. One of the reasons we're going through first John is to find out, do we really know the Lord? We want to be sure of our salvation. And so the question is, do I really know the Lord? So last time in first John, we saw that John is concerned. These are the two points we walked away with, with knowing Christ and understanding sin. They're doctrinal issues. They have to do with how we know those things. Do we know the real Christ? Do we understand sin, sin nature, how it affects us, how we need to repent from it? We read that uh, some claimed to walk in the light while walking in darkness and claiming to have no sin. And we all struggle with sin, but the good news is we didn't end at the end of chapter one. We kept reading into a little bit of chapter two, specifically verses one and two, which remind us that we have an advocate that is Christ when we do Mm. fail. So today we're going to see another uh, two markers that you can test your faith by uh, as we look at chapter two. And we're only going to look at verses three through 17, which if you do the math is not that many verses, but there's a lot packed in it. There's a lot packed in. So Colton and I are going to be talking for a while, but before we do, I think it would be advantageous to read verses three through 17. So Colton, would you do the honors? Yeah. All right. For it. First John chapter two, verses three through 17. Yep. This is the word of God. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is the new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not the father It is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Bam. All right. That's the section we're looking at today. So we can kind of break it into a bit of sections. I mean, it's different translations. You may even see it's broken in certain sections, but we already did chapter two, verse one and two. So we're going to pick up at three. And I think it's worth looking at three to six. Colton, what is going on? Yeah, I think the big question is, and we have to ask off the bat, is what does it mean to know God? Good like point. Good we're, point. we're tying in this idea of knowing someone specifically, not just knowing facts about them, but knowing them personally. And this, this um, next piece, uh, this chunk right here is about obedience and love. 
obedience and love. And it's something John is going to drive in. Those are the two markers we're going to look for. Yeah. <laughs> and the points to know God. I do want to take a moment. I think it's important to say this. We joke at the beginning about knowing mm. Ryan Reynolds, perhaps, because we've seen him in a movie. Uh, to take anybody else. If I ask you the question, how well do you know them? And you would say, oh, I know this person. Yeah, fairly well. Okay. How did you come to that conclusion? Because is it a factual thing? And I think you can be, how do I word this? You can be really good at Bible trivia mm -hmm. and not know the Lord. Uh, for example, I can know for fact via the Bible or other historical documents that there was a man named Jesus who lived a long time ago. I can know for a fact via the Bible, just knowing what's in the Bible, that Jesus died on a cross. I can know via the Bible that Jesus was born of a virgin. I can know that there are four gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But knowing God is not knowing facts. So to know God, when we read that in verse three, where it says, and by this we know that we have come to know him. To know him is to know for oneself or know him personally for oneself mm -hmm. to have a relationship with him. Knowing facts about the Lord, knowing facts about Jesus mm -hmm. does not save. Yeah. And maybe like you've heard the cliche just come to mind of like, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? In, in reality, it's knowing Jesus means you have a personal relationship. Yeah. And I think that's what you're pointing out. Like um, I can know how to change oil out on my car. But knowing something doesn't mean I'm actually going to do it and be able to do it. <laughs> right. I just know the facts how to do it. So I think you're pointing out something that's crucial for Christians to understand in our walk. It's, it's about a personal relationship. Yeah. You ever seen someone say they know Jesus and then you go, you look, you kind of observe and you're like, uh, I can't really put this together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think verse four, by the way, once we move into verse four, all of a sudden we kind of see that whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. All right, here we go. Test. You, you mentioned it already. What's, what's one of our tests coming out of today? Well, if you claim to know the Lord and you want to be sure, one of the questions you can ask yourself is, do you keep his commandments? Mm. And I like your illustration. You can know something like how to change the oil on a car, but if you don't do it, it's just useless information, really. Yeah. Um, hey, you got some other stuff written down here. What, what do we got going on? Yeah, I think one of the things that James battles a lot in his letter that comes to mind as I'm reading this is, yes, this connection between I know God personally has to result in obedience because of, like James uh, 2, 8 through 20 says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Almost like they're two separate things. Right. Like in, in for James, this topic was like, somebody was claiming to have faith, but they didn't have works. Um, and he continues to go on, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown you foolish person that faith a part of works is useless? And the facts is like, I mean, Satan, the demons know of God, probably know a lot more facts than we do, but they don't submit to him. They don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. So like at the end of the day, it's like, we, we need to, yes, know the facts of the Lord, but also may that result in our love for the Lord. Gotcha. Tell me about Elliot. Oh, the, he's a guy that uh, reoccurs in my nightmares, but actually existed. <laughs> um, okay. But I just like to make up more stories about him. But so far, I haven't made up any that I've told people. Like, sure. this is a real story. Um, so he, he was my neighbor when I lived in a shed about a year and a half ago. Uh, yes, from a previous podcast, The Shed. Y yes, yes, yep. the, the Shed Life. There was this guy who was about uh, 10 feet away from my porch, um, technically bedroom. My place was really small, so it was all like... Fair. Yeah. Um, but his porch was there too. So he would... Um, we would have to talk a lot because I would walk right by his place, basically, and just get in conversation. And just, you know, I try to casually slip in the gospel, like, hey, man, like, what do you believe? So like, Elliot is a non-believer. Elliot, um, he, he goes by many, many nicknames. <laughs> he has a portrait of Hitler in his bedroom. So he got the nickname Nazi Elliot simply because he's an unbeliever who just like resulted in just like not caring about his life. This is very interesting. Yeah. Um, but he's a real person. Yep. 
and he was just a drunk, didn't work. So constantly I would ask like, what's your faith like? So you would, you'd walk by and try and present the gospel to him. mm -hmm. All right. And I've gotten other people speak into his life. Um, but he basically every time would say, yeah, I know there's a creator God. I know about Jesus Christ, but every day you could tell the result of his works were nothing. They were dead. Like he was unfruitful in his Christian life. So like, he's always an example that sticks in my mind of someone who goes, yeah, I know the facts, but it doesn't change me. Mm. I know these things, but I'm not going to go to church because that's too much work. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. By the way, if you struggle with wondering if you know God versus knowing God, or let me phrase this, if you read the Bible and you go, sweet, I've racked up on facts from that chapter, but I'm not sure how to move them into knowing God better. I just want to really quick mention, there's a great book you should read by J.I. Packer called Knowing God. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't like reading books or you pick it up and look at the size of it and go, oh no, just read the first five chapters. Um, it is important that we move. I like this phrase from Joel Beakey. We move that knowledge from our head to our hearts. Hmm. And that is how you can know God better. All right. Well, by the way, we're moving pretty slow paced right now. We will pick up, but verse five, all of a sudden we run into something interesting. Mm -hmm. So verse five, once we know that we need to keep the commandments of the Lord, but whoever keeps his word, so true believers in him, truly the love of God is perfected by this. We may know that we are in him love of God. We run into something interesting where we learn that Colton and I seem to land on different pages. Yeah. So Colton, there are options for how we can take that little phrase, love of God. Mm -hmm. What are our options? Yeah. There's different thoughts because basically what he's doing here is he's saying, okay, the person who does keep the word in him, the love of God is perfected. So he's almost like revealing the behind the scenes of like what's going on within the change of the believer. You know, if they are obeying him, then they have been changed. So that's that's the basis. But there's there's confusion. Exactly this term, the love of God is perfected. It can mean like three three different things, right. which are debated exactly what it is. Right. But yes, at the end of the day, it's a change. And the three is man's love for God, God's love for man. So reverse it, or a God kind of love in man. All right. I just want to give an analogy. If you heard Colton say that, first of all, hit the backwards button, the backwards by 10 seconds, if you want to hear him say it again. But um, if you're still confused as to what he is saying, I like this little example, a bowl of silver. Does it mean the bowl is made of silver or the bowl is full of silver? And it's the same kind of thing going on when you read the word of, you're trying to figure out, okay, is it God's love directed at man? Is it man's love directed at God? Or is it a God kind of love placed in a man and seen and displayed through man? So the ESV, which we're reading says love of God. The NIV makes an interpretive choice and says love for God. Yeah. Colton, this is my take. Okay. I think if you look at the rest of first John, the next time he brings up the idea, a similar phrase, that love of God uh, concerning obedience, which is what's going on in this section, this chapter five, verse three, it clearly means a believer's love for God, a love that is the Christian's affection directed towards God. My take. Yeah. All right. I mean, (laughs) it's, it's not something directly revealed, (laughs) True, but it does seem like five, three could point to that, but I feel like it could also land on a different area. All right. What what would that be? I would say, I would think it's a God kind of love in man. Okay. And why I would say that specifically, and this is going to be a little bit nerdy, but this is what (laughs) I enjoy. And this is what I looked up for like 20 minutes. Cause I was just curious. I did not know much about this. I didn't know people landed in so many different camps. Right. For me, it seems like this is possessive of God's love. And why I say that is because when you see of God, which I think the NIV actually has this wrong, (laughs) it's in the genitive case. And simply that type of case in Greek uh, encapsulates something that's possessive. So I have this of God, God has this love. So it's saying, okay, the love of God, like that's very specific, that of right there for English. Yep. So it's saying, okay, this is the love of God. And there's other verses elsewhere that kind of point to this reality that we shouldn't be surprised at. I think another one is 2 Corinthians 5, 14, where it says the love of Christ controls us. It's not the love for Christ. It's the love of Christ. And in reality, 
I don't think this should change your view of this passage a whole lot. No. But it also should just make you know the reality of, yes, God first loved us, so we love him. So maybe this is, for my view, it takes a step back to go all the way back to God loving us, and this is what generates that love for him. Yep. Now, the good news is, even if we disagree, we understand this point, that we ought to obey the commandments of Mm -hmm. God for whoever keeps his word, keeps his commandments in him truly, the love of God is perfected. And Mm -hmm. by this, we can know that we know him. Yeah. All right. So we haven't ventured too far. We're we're not going to throw hands just yet. Okay. Not yet. We probably won't, especially not by the time we get to the end of this passage. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. Verse six, finishing out the idea of being obedience. Uh, obedient, all right? Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Russell has a great uh, line that he uses here. I'm not sure it's original to him. I'm just accrediting him because he says it all the time. Hmm. Followers of Jesus, follow Jesus. Wow. If you know the Lord and claim to be a follower of Christ, you are going to follow Christ and what he said. Hmm. And again, we're going to fail, but great news, we have an advocate that is Christ who is the propitiation for our sins he has paid for them so that when we fail they are not counted against us all right Mm -hmm. picking up at verse seven let's talk about love (laughs) (laughs) i was i was guessing in my mind why you were smiling in that moment but this makes sense now (laughs) oh boy Uh, in my mind all that's playing through is the song what is love which is horrible because that's all i think about when i read this passage that's horrifying I hope you also don't think about that when we get to first John four, I hope it's purged of your mind by then. (laughs) I'm just kidding. All right. Verse, uh, yeah, we're talking about love here. So the first Colton alluded this uh, alluded to this already. So one of the things we should check is our obedience. Are we obedient to what the word says? Now this next section, we talk about, are we characterized by love beloved? I am writing to you at verse seven, no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. We ought to be characterized as a people who love. Mm -hmm. So, when I'm reading this passage, it almost confuses me. All right. It keeps bringing back like this back and forth in from my sem- sense of clarity. Like I need your help with this. Sure. What is this new commandment he keeps bringing up? Okay. New commandment. And we're like borderline at the end of our Bibles. If you have a physical uh-huh. Bible, you can see that there's a lot less on the right side than there is on the left. Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying here it's new commandment, but then he's also saying it's an old commandment that they've heard from the beginning. All right. A couple things. First of all, you have, where's it gone? Okay. We know we've seen this before in the gospel of John chapter 13, verse 34, you see a new commandment I give to you. And then he tells them to be loving, even as I have loved you. It's an example. It's that's an example now attached to the commandment, making it new. So it's not that loving each other is new. It's not that loving people is new. It's that Christ adds that he is an example of fulfillment of, and he says that even as I have loved you. So it's not so much a new commandment in that it's new, now there's another layer here. Um, so yeah. Why, yeah. why don't you talk about love for a moment? Yeah. And then I'll, I'll circle back. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it, it confuses me a little bit, but it, it just brings us back to what John is like getting at this entire passage he is about the law of love, loving others. Well, it seems like, <clears throat> and I remember, um, one time when I was working at a camp and there was a staff discipleship groups and each group had about seven guys or seven girls. I was in the guys group, surprisingly. Makes sense. Yes, yes. And we had a main leader who is more mature, who is able to pour into us. And I remember one time we're meeting and he just all of a sudden goes, do you guys actually love Jesus? I was like, yeah, dude, I'm literally working at a camp. Like that's going through (laughs) my mind. I'm like, I'm working at a camp that's literally to spread the gospel to youth. And right. I'm like, that that's such a dumb question. But he, he ended up reading this passage, this whole passage. And okay. he's like, well, if you truly love Jesus, you're going to be obedient. You're going to love others well and be in the light of the gospel. And I was like, okay, like that's, that's interesting. I need to be reminded that as a believer, right. 
not just, okay, yeah, I'm confirmed to believer already. As I read through first John, I could see the, the marks that I pass, but also it's a good reminder for me that I am to be obedient to love others well. Now you see this command to love people early on. You actually have it written uh, down here. So where do we see this in the Old Testament, loving one another? Yeah, we see it, of course, scattered around because I mean, the Old Testament could be based off loving God and loving others as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But in Leviticus 19, 18, it specifically says, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And there's also the Shema, which I believe is in Deuteronomy 6, 5, which is the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So within that, you get the two commandments combined, love God and love people. And this is just almost like a reiteration of that. Yeah, so then by the gospel of John, you have Jesus saying a new commandment I give to you to love one another, even as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Uh, So then in first John, when he says it's, you know, it gets a little confused. It's not a new command, it is a new command. It's an old commandment you've heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment I'm writing to you. Here's the thing. It's not new as in it's never been heard before, Hmm. right? Rather, it's an old one they likely know well. Uh, And then when it says since the beginning, he clarifies what he means. Since the beginning when the gospel was shared with the command to love. Hmm. Uh, And here you have that it's it's a new command because darkness is passing away, while light is shining, and the command is finding true full expression in both Christ and the readers. So Jesus personified that love from the Old Testament. And now it is seen in and through New Testament believers and even in us now. That's what makes it new at this point post Jesus. Do you think, because in my study, like I found even the slightest of terms, like trying to understand that, do you think the love your neighbor as yourself to the updated love your neighbor as I have loved you, Jesus speaking, do you think that's like the big tagline of like, this is the big difference? Uh, <laughs> I guess this is our curiosity. I think, I think love your neighbor as yourself gives us an extent because most of us mm-hmm. default love ourself. I think what makes it a new commandment when Christ says it, um, specifically is that Christ fulfills it perfectly mm-hmm. and gives us an example to follow. Um, you know, instead of, and I think it's a much better reference as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, our love is broken, but Christ's is not. Yeah. So I don't answer that with great, uh, validity, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> but that's my thought process. Yeah. You know, we follow after Christ. Christ is the example in Philippians mm-hmm. when we're going through Philippians, right? Christ is the perfect example of mm-hmm. humility. We have some broken examples in Paul, Epaphroditus and Timothy at the end of chapter two. Yeah. That whole chapter talking about humility though. One of the, the chief example is Christ in verses mm-hmm. five through 11. And so I think as it comes to love, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, we're pretty broken. We love ourselves by default. We should love other people that much. Mm-hmm. But if you want to know what love looks like fulfilled, it's Christ. Yeah. Yeah. He takes it almost a step further, like drilling the point home of just love like God loves people. Yeah. Follow after and follow after Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but here's the, so here's the thing that comes out of nine to 10. This is the big one. Okay. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. Verse nine said the backwards, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. A love for fellow believers specifically should mark the Christian. Um, If you're, let me, let me give you a personal application. If you're a Christian who looks for downfalls and disagreements in someone's doctrine uh, for the for the sake of pointing out differences and being unloving and callous towards people, or maybe you're just unloving because their sin is greater than yours. Hmm. That's, that is not Christ like love that proves that you are in the light. And we need to, we need to be able to split what things matter and love one another with Christ, uh, with Christ like love that is energized by the, the Holy spirit. Um, I think it's really important that we understand that. And one of the jokes we make around here all the time, you and I talk about it too, Mm. you know, people that believe in baptizing believers Mm. or baptizing babies, Mm -hmm. they can love one another and get along very, very well. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, but that's something you need to look for then is, are you someone that loves fellow believers? Do you love the people in your church? Do you love those that love Christ as well? Mm-hmm. Cause the commandment isn't love those who you agree with, <laughs> so love, love, <laughs> love all the brothers, yeah, even love the difficult ones. And that yeah. by the way is the, I think that's a real litmus test for if you love people, do you love the people that are difficult to love? Mm. Um, 
That's what I got. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's within that we see the badge for us as Christians. Like if we were to wear any badge, it is love for others. Yeah. Just like what you're saying of like, that is the mark. That is like, if you were to look for one mark um, of someone who identifies as a believer, you're looking for love for others. And that's what, that's what the definition is. Like if I were to say what a believer is, it's someone who loves God and loves others. Yeah. And it's funny too, because if the Bible commands that of us, it's also a command we have to follow. <laughs> yeah. So, so now in our, in our quest for how do we know we're truly saved or not? Here's, mm -hmm. you know, we've got two more things. Are we obedient to what the word says? One of the things the word says is be loving. Are we loving? And yes, this matters because, you know, people see the world can see, should see is what I ought to say. The world should see that the church is different. The world should see that Christians are different. And one of the biggest markers is that they are a loving people mm -hmm. and they love one another and they uh, realize that they have no right to be in Christ's family, saved by Christ in God's family. Mm -hmm. And yet they are. All right. Then we run into this interesting section, which again, we're looking at ESV. So it's uh, offset. It's no longer just block text anymore from verse 12 to mm -hmm. 14. Yeah, it's almost like, and you don't see this in John's writings much, like a personal pause, like this almost like pause in the theology breakdown of, okay, we're going to address certain groups. So what kind of groups do we see addressed here in like, I'm confused as reading this, what am I looking for? How am I supposed to view this passage? Well, there's a couple options. Um, so you see three titles used in these, uh, four verses or 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. It's three verses. I can't count. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you see three different titles used. Uh, you see children, mm -hmm. you see fathers and you see young men. And we have a couple of options. Okay. And people hotly debate these. Are these different groups of people? Uh, in a spiritual sense, are little children weak Christians while fathers are mature Christians? Are these actual groups in where John is writing? So the recipients of the letter are these three distinct groups. Uh, or some people will say that children is a catch-all blanket. So everybody falls into the children category while then fathers and young men are distinct groups within hmm. the children category. So let just before we even look at that, what does he tell each of these groups? Hmm. Yeah. He tells certain lines that are actually repeated. Hmm. And it's interesting that you bring the spiritual maturity as opposed to, Oh, these are actual people who are at different levels of maturity, children, young men and fathers. But he tells each one of these groups per se out of these three, what specifically the truth they are, they know what truth they have shown. He tells the children, your sins are forgiven and you know the father. Like he, he tells them these two truths specifically. Yeah. And then he tells the young men and that's really highlighted at the end of verse 14 saying, I write to you young men because you are strong. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And then he tells the fathers, you know him who is from the beginning talking about God. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. What, what do you take away from something like this? <laughs> a couple of things. Um, I get, let me, ask, can I ask you this first? Yeah. Do you think that these are spiritually defined groups, actual groups, or just different terms for the same group? Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm still coming to that conclusion. Fair. Of like, it's, it's not directly revealed in either way with John's writing, you could go both ways. Right with the type of um, That's fair. symbolic nature he writes. Yep. Yeah, the arguments pose, like, for example, I think it's First Timothy 5 is where you see fathers, but it's an allusion to older people, mm -hmm. like actually older, not more mature than Timothy, just older than Timothy. Yeah. So there you have, like, that's one leg for one of those arguments. I am under the impression, <laughs> Okay. back to our knowing God talk, uh -huh. that these are three spiritual camps you can fall into fall into like you are either in your spiritual okay. walk, a little child, a young man or a father, older, mature, wiser, mm -hmm. and perhaps even shepherding other people. If you want to use that parental analogy. Yeah. Um, I think that because 
little children, your sins are forgiven, right? Uh, someone that's uh, young in the faith, I mean, they've just been saved, perhaps. They may not know a whole lot, but they belong to Christ and their sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Hmm. Fathers know him who is from the beginning and I'll come back. It's the no that makes me think that these are different groups. Okay. And then young men, you are strong. So I think that children are those who are just saved, but maybe don't know a whole lot. They don't have all the doctrine down. They can't answer all the questions, yeah. but they do for sure uh, know the father and their sins are forgiven. Young men, I think are strong. They're the, they're the ones that read through the word to know all the answers. <laughs> They, so they can tell you the things about the Lord. They can tell you where things are in the Bible. They can make doctr doctrinal and theological arguments. And then I think fathers, I think it emphasizes, and it says it twice, that you know him who is from the beginning. That says it there at the end of 13, and then it says it again in 14. Uh, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I think that's important because th it's a, like a different kind of no. Hmm. In that, like knowing God, yeah. Is that when they read the Bible, the spiritual mature, when they read the Bible, it's not to know the facts, but to just know the God behind mm. the Bible. And it's an intimate relationship where they're growing in a knowledge of the Lord, not in factual sake, mm -hmm. like perhaps a young man studying doctrine and theology, but growing in their knowledge of the Lord. They know God. Yeah. And they've meditated on it. They're growing in him, Christ likeness, and they're knowing him better. It's like, you know, old people that have very strong relationships. That's what I, that's, uh -huh. that's how I'm like interpreting it. So yeah. I walk away from that going and having read some of the arguments in the commentaries, it's just, I'm most inclined to think mm -hmm. these are three spiritual camps of people. Yeah. And I think I lean that way as well because of the simple fact of how John continually says things, children, this children, yeah. this, he's not speaking to specifically the children when he's introducing a thought, he's usually speaking to everybody in the church. Yeah. So it's almost like, like you were saying, like, this is like the basic, um, if you're a child, you know, these basic facts, Yeah. but then there's the level up per se, I guess you could say that's an up. accurate way to describe it. Spiritual yeah. Level As you up. grow in your walk, you become a young man. That sounds more biblical. I like spiritual okay. level up, <laughs> we'll go with that. but basically when you level up in your faith to becoming a young man, you're displaying the things you already know, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And then as a father, which I've read a couple commentaries on this father, they're specifically highlighting um, that they know God from the beginning because the fathers are passing it down to the next generation. Yeah. As God has revealed himself in the beginning and has been passed down through generations. Yeah. So it does seem like it could go both ways. Yeah. Maybe it's both and, but it and, seems and like I'm, it's more than I'm spiritual. perfectly willing that I walk away from somebody, like with somebody else believing that it's all one group mm. or that it's actual, like, I don't think it's actual groups. I think it, I don't think we can make that argument, but mm. <clears throat> I'm perfectly happy with someone that says these are three titles for the same group of people. But I just, I do think, you know, we joke about the spiritual level. I think it's three stages you can be in, in mm -hmm. your spiritual walk. And by the way, if that is the case, how do you move from one to the next? I again, encourage you to read chapters one mm -hmm. through five on J.I. Packer's knowing God. There's a, there's a big difference. Again, we joke. There's a big difference between knowing facts about God. Yeah. Like perhaps the young man studying, you know, to be strong and in, in understanding of the word. Um, and knowing he who is from the beginning, mm. like the father, I think there's a difference. Yeah. Um, so it, you, you, we ought to strive to move from one to the next. If that, yeah. if, if we're landing that, that they are different, then we ought to strive moving through them. And I, I think it is still going back to the idea. This is a pause for John to encourage the people, mm -hmm. encourage the churches, the church, the area that are receiving and reading this letter Yep. to be encouraged. Yeah. Like he, he's observing their faith and as like an older John, the apostle, you know, still saying, Hey, you guys are doing great. Keep it up. Yep. And I think that pause is needed because he goes into a pretty drastic prohibition in verse 15. So 15, 16 and 17 to the end, what not to love. Mm -hmm. So we're done talking about love for a moment. Now it's like a, shouldn't this be obvious? What not to love. Now I say, shouldn't this be obvious? Because I think we've been, we sit under pastors and preachers who say things like you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't love and serve two masters. You love the Lord, the Lord alone, or you don't. Right. So what not to love? Shouldn't this be obvious is my anecdotal thing. However, 
me saying, shouldn't this be obvious is a lot harder than practicing this. So mm-hmm. the world versus 15, 16, 17, the world walks contrary to what it means to follow God. You have an illustration for us. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating to see the clear line he's drawn of like, you're either loving the world or you're not. And there's things in the world. He's not saying like, you know, hate everything that like food or movies or good things God has. So there are good things in the world. Yeah. There's good things in the world, but he's saying specifically earthly things, which he defines. Um, it's kind of funny. I heard this story recently from another preacher, but I can't remember who because I listen to a lot of different people. Fair. But he basically said, yeah, when he was in college, he would simply um, look at this one unbeliever and do the complete opposite of what that <laughs> believer does. Why? Because that believer was, that unbeliever was following the ways of the world. And the believer was like, this is how I know not to follow the things of the world. And that's that's a funny illustration, but... I think that's what he's pointing out. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. Right. So you're either going to follow the father who, you know, your love is directed towards him or you're going to love the world. And when you love the world, you're just displaying that the love of the father has not changed you from the inside out. So what happens to the things of the world? What happens like the end result? What's the end result? It seems like here, He's given us in verse 17, this idea that it's all passing away. Like it's just an idea. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the, he's introducing the idea. Do you like that better? Sure. We'll go with that. He's introducing the idea of, and we know this in John's further um, readings in revelation that, you know, the things of this world are passing away and the new creation will come. The yeah. new, the new uh, home will be new heaven will be placed on earth. So there's this idea here being introduced and I want to see what you think exactly what he's going for here and why he's saying this. Oh boy. But he's saying the world's passing away. Don't love the things of the world because it will come to an end. Right. You ask me things like I know things. Sometimes I don't. Most of the time I don't. (laughs) I'm just giving you a hard time. (laughs) Yeah. So you have this prohibition Uh, in verse 15, right? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Here's why, because it's a marker. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. Mm. Your love is either for believers and for God, for fellow image bearer and for God, Mm. or it's for the world. Now he does qualify what are the things of the world. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, uh, definition, (laughs) the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father, but from the world. And yes, I think that definition is helpful because like you were just joking about a minute ago, there are good things in this world. I don't mean they're intrinsically good, but there are uh, not harmful things that we can enjoy doing. If you enjoy biking or music, just because it's in the world doesn't all of a sudden make it a terror. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still good things. And furthermore, they can be used for the glory of God. Yeah. But the things of the world that we really ought to be on the lookout for, and you should consider, do these sound like things you love? Do you love the desires of the flesh? Do you love the desires of the eyes? That is the things that you see with your eyes and all of a sudden are tempted to chase after quite literally. Do you love the pride of life? Which is probably better, most accurately translated again via there's some dispute, but Mm -hmm. the, the pride of things, the pride of owning things, possessions, status, Mm -hmm. more so the possessions like flexing what you got. Yeah. Those, you know, if those are the things that you take pleasure in, then it is not from the father, but it is from the world. And you should not love those things because, and here's a bit of a reason the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever, forever, meaning into eternity. It will not end your, uh, your, well, we say like when you go to heaven, you mm-hmm. will spend an eternity praising the Lord. Yeah. By the way, this whole passage just made me think of a song. Uh, and I wrote it down here. There's a song that we sing here called turn your eyes upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, All the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, all these other things will fade. You don't have to worry because not only will they fade from your perception, but they are fading and fleeting anyway, right? You just said a moment ago, you know, there's a new heaven, a new earth that we have to look forward to. Um, these things will grow dim. They should grow dim. That's a marker that we're growing in our affection towards Christ. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's the takeaway. What all have we learned in our venture to be sure of our salvation? Well, 
that we ought to be obedient to Jesus' commands, obedience, there's point one, and specifically his command to love fellow believers. Love. What do we love? I think these things reveal where our affection is and can help us to discern, are we in Christ or are we not? Right? That command for love. It was an old command handed down with the gospel, and now John is calling it a new command that it ought to be fulfilled and seen in us. Right? A hatred for fellow believers proves that one lives in darkness of sin. Mm. So consider yourself for a moment, if you're listening to this podcast and you've taken up going through first John, either because we chose it and you feel like listening or because you want to be sure of your salvation. Are you an obedient person? Are you marked by being loving? Do other people mark you as being loving? That's a great question. You should ask other people around you that know you. Hmm. Are you loving towards those that are hard to love? That's a very easy diagnosis. (laughs) The last time you encountered someone difficult in your church, for example, did you love them? Are your affections in the wrong places? These would be negative things to look for. Do you crave things sinfully when you see them? Do you have pride over your possessions? Do you have and cave into fleshly desire all the time? These are things that are the antithesis of God's followers and someone who has a love for God, right? Be reminded again that for the believer, because hey, we all fail. We read that. We struggle with sin. It's not gone. We're not in glory. We're not made perfect. The moment we're saved, we still struggle with these things. So be reminded that for the believer, sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. You get to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is the propitiation for your sins. And uh, you are made strong and able to overcome because of Jesus Christ. Any, Any final thoughts? Oh, that's awesome. Those are some good takeaways that we should be asking ourselves even as believers. Yeah. And so here's, here's where we land, by the way, so far, if you're keeping, keeping track with us, you need to know and understand Christ. You need to know and understand sin. Hmm. You need to be marked by obedience and you ought to be marked by love. That's where we are so far as we venture through first John. All right. To our friends that are listening, we trust to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly this week. No matter how you're getting this episode, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment or review. It really helps us out. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And be sure to check out all our other McGregor podcast channels. Just head over to knowthewordpodcast.com for all the details. Thanks for listening.